and tell me a little bit about where you're from. You can put it in the chat box. I'm, uh, I'm delivering this webinar from Sunny Bruno. Uh, we've got people from Hong Kong. Uh, we've got people from Brazil and uh, Lithuania, Russia, Peru, Mexico, Croatia, Ukraine, Morocco. So great. All over the place. Wonderful. Venezuela uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so, and Greece. Perfect. So thank you very much for giving up your time uh, for the next hour. Uh, let's get on with a little bit of housekeeping. We've got lots to get through. Um, again, if you've attended one of these webinars before, you'll know that uh, the session is being recorded and you'll have access to the recordings. Also, you'll get sent an electronic um, certificate of attendance. And if we have time, which I doubt given the fact that we, we didn't quite have enough time in the first two webinars that I've delivered today, there'll be time for questions. But if you, if you want to write the questions in the chat box as we go along, if I see them, I'll try and, uh, and uh, send it to you. Uh, again, the, ac the recording access will be given a link, I believe. Okay, let's crack on. So, uh, step three, monitoring progress. Um, we're going to look at these six different things. Probably the bulk, though, of this particular webinar will be looking at exam strategies. Um, if we look at the steps, I think we're off the naughty step now. Uh, Lindsay did the first two sessions, understanding the exam and balancing uh, your teaching. I'm doing this session, and I'll be delivering the session next week, uh, Wednesday, same three times. If you can attend, that would be great. Um, and as I said, we're going to talk about identifying progress points, building exam strategies, tracking progress, offering guidance and supervision, reviewing key concepts, and differentiating skills. So, so let's get a move on. Uh, when we talk about exams, there are many different uh, uh, international exams, uh, American, British. Um, for references to this webinar, I'm going to be looking at the Cambridge Main Suite examinations, uh, and particularly the B2, the first certificate, which used to be known as the FCE. Um, mainly this is because the B1, the old PET exam, uh, is changing format from January next year and is going to look uh, more similar rather than less similar to, to FCE. So hopefully that's okay. We'll be using that as a reference point. Let's talk about identifying progress points. Now, for all of us who teach exam classes, we know it's a little different um, because primarily when we're teaching exam classes, we teach the exam and exam strategies first, and then as a byproduct, they sort of improve their English, or we hope they do. Um, so when we start, we have to really look at, at, at where the students are. We have to, 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 to look at where we're starting from, and we have to look at where we're going. Um, and, and then we have to make stages along that journey that are accessible for us as teachers to monitor and accessible for the students to, to, to understand and be transparent. Um, so. I think what we're looking at is, is clarifying or developing student learning outcomes, which, which are referred to as SLOs. And these are outcomes where we're going to enhance exam performance. And uh, we're going to match those outcomes to some sort of framework. Uh, there are lots of different frameworks out there. Uh, the standard one in Europe is the CEFRA, the Common European Framework of Reference. Um, but we'll have a look at a few others. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you use your own framework, as long as it's transparent and tied into the exam. Um, and we need these, this, this, this framework so that we can tie students into to where they are and where they're going to go. So we can work out um, the, the training gap, if you like, what, what needs to, to, to be done. So we have to ask ourselves several questions. Um, here are a few standard ones that I think it's good to start with. Um, we have to ask ourselves as teachers what we want our students to learn. And, and, and again, uh, we have to decide what they already know. Now, depending on your teaching situation, you could find that you've, you, you're teaching students for an academic year and they start the semester not quite at the level 
of the exam, let's say they're B1 or B1 plus, and so you might have to be very careful and, and, and you have to refine what you're teaching so you're not exposing the students to stuff that's too difficult for them to start off with. Uh, but then you have to monitor how their knowledge is changing and their thinking is changing over time. Now with, with, with anything uh, in terms of exam strategies, um, I don't think you're going to give much more than, than 10 or 15 percent to the student. But if the student is of the level, that 10 or 15 percent can make the difference between, between passing and failing an exam. You have to be clear to the students what's expected of them and where they are. And you also have to give them evidence that they're improving. So I think um, throughout this, throughout the course, you're going to be using assessment devices. And it's, it's good, perhaps, to review a few simple assessment devices uh, as we begin. So one of the big buzzwords in our profession at the moment is assessment, uh, assessment for learning, uh, as opposed to assessment of learning. Uh, and again, we're going to look at how this ties into some traditional um, assessment uh, criteria or, or, or labels. Um, so, so let's have a look. Um, can anyone tell me the difference between an achievement test and a, a, a proficient a achievement assessment and proficiency assessment? Well, in most courses, let's have a look, see if we've got any answers. Lots of people type, typing. They're still, uh, yeah, so, so Lucy's saying um, uh, basically how far you've got and how well you can do it. I think that's a, a, a pretty good um, viewpoint. Proficiency, um, we've got four skills are tested. Um, again, yeah, I think, I think if we look at it, um, we can say that the achievement, uh, if we're using a course book and at the end of every unit or at the end of every three units, there's a progress test. And that progress test is is automatically going to be looking at have you achieved what's been taught? Have you have you learnt what what's been um, what's been presented in class? Whereas uh, at the beginning of a course, we might like to place students, and we might like to see what sort of level they are already. So so we want an overall point of where they are. So we can pretty much say achievement assessment of those sort of progress tests. Uh, are looking to the past and uh, and proficiency uh, assessment is is looking to the future. You know where are they on the journey to to reaching their 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 target aims? Um, I think we use both types of assessment during an exam course. Uh, here's the next one for you: uh, norm referencing and criterion referencing. Any ideas? Basically, um, norm referencing is, is pretty unusual in standardized testing, uh, but it's quite useful to do in a, in a class situation. Um, if I look in my dim and distant past at my own educational experience, uh, there was one school in the UK. Um, yeah, exactly, Lucy, perfect uh, description. One school in the UK where, where we had to line up would you believe, at the end of every term, in a line where the first person in the line was the best student and uh, the one nearest the student uh, teacher at the back was, uh, was the worst. And that's norm referencing. That's, that's how they compare against each other. Criterion referencing, obviously, how they compare against a set of criteria. Uh, in, in, in this case, we're talking about our, our, our performance framework. So it could be the CFR. Um, and again, we'd use both. Now, uh, criterion referencing, mastery, learning, and continuum. If we're teaching for a specific exam and we've got a specific cutoff point, then obviously we're talking about mastery learning. Uh, and if we embrace the EU's lifelong learning, uh, and, and every point you are is a, is a point on a journey to progression, then we're very, very much in a, in a continuum. And I think, uh, I think, again, it's useful to, to, to look at these areas. Uh, obviously, in terms of, uh, as, as I think someone mentioned, uh, Guadalupe said, uh, you know, we're always assessing students. And that's true. You know, in class, we're always 
giving them tasks and, 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 and seeing how they perform at those tasks and making judgments about their, their, their performance based on, on, on the quality of that. Uh, again, though, at the end of uh, an exam or at the end of a course, when they have to take the exam, it's very fixed. And I think we can talk a little bit about, again, formative and summative. If we say assessment of learning uh, would be one of those, an assessment for learning uh, would be another. Which is which, do you think? Uh, again, formative, if we're forming an idea, if we're developing an idea, if we're looking at, 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 at how we can improve something, then this is very much assessment for learning. We're, we're testing to see what, what needs, what we need more of or less of. Summative, I think Jeremy Harmer says it quite well. Summative testing is, is, is like sudden death events, you know. The, the exam's tomorrow, you either pass or you fail. Formative, again, is like a, a cook tasting the soup. Do we need a little bit more of this, a little less of that? And it, 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 it sort of encourages us to, to adjust the course. Of course, always, we're teaching the students rather than the book, and we need to look at, at how we mark. Um, obviously, some, some things are easier to mark than others, uh, but we have to have some sort of grading system. And we have to make sure that students have their own grading system, too, that there's a plenty of opportunities for them to reflect and, and look and, and, and see for themselves, because I've yet to see a class of more than one student where they're all the same level. And so they all have different strengths and weaknesses, and we have to look at... Um, uh, and making sure that we, we give specialized training to each of those students in the class. Another thing to consider with assessment is, is this washback or backwash. I mean, both are acceptable terms, meaning the, the, the psychological effect of, uh, of the test on the students. As I mentioned earlier in this webinar, if we've got the students for nine months, is it appropriate to start off with uh, exam tasks that, that they're not going to perform well at? Should we, should we sort of scaffold the students a little bit at the beginning to make sure that, that, that they're capable of performing quite well? Um, because obviously if I give them all a test in, in September and the average score is about 35%, they're all going to look like the woman in the slide. You know, oh my goodness, no chance. Whereas uh, if we... Uh, if we, if we sort of perhaps help and support them too much, and the average score is about 96%, they'll say, well, there's no point doing that. Again, as I mentioned, we need a framework. We could use the Cambridge Assessment Framework if you're using Cambridge examinations. You can use the Pearson Global Scale of English, um, the CEFRA Framework, or, or, or it doesn't really matter what framework you use. I mean, if you have your own grading system, fine. But you have to make sure that that grading system is tied in to the exam that they're going to take and that it's clear for the students how the, the, the grades, let's say you've got a 10-point scale, does a 6 mean that they would pass the examination or would they need a 7 or an 8 to say this is definitely a pass? You have to make sure that your, your learning framework, your learning progression framework is tied into the exam. So, uh, again, uh, you also need different frameworks for different skills. Um, you, you, can, you can have an overall proficiency score, but um, obviously every student has different areas of strengths and weaknesses, and they need to know where their weaknesses are in order for you to support them. Um, so, let's look at the main part. Let's look at, at building exam strategies. Um, Let's start with, with reading, and uh, let's, let's, let's look at three separate uh, activities for reading. Let's look at multiple choice and, and matching and gap texts. Um, I, I, these are standard uh, Cambridge tests, but they exist in, in, in most, most uh, reading texts that we, we know. Um, before we start, let's let's consider reading and, and, and let's review it in terms of uh, student awareness. A few years ago, the EU uh, looked at students' performance uh, in English exams for school leaving uh, tests. 
um, where they had integrated skills, you know, reading, writing, listening, and, and speaking. And they found that actually students don't perform that well at reading. Um, and it's quite, quite interesting because if you ask your class uh, what, what parts of the exam are you, you worried about, generally your students will look at the, 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 the ones like, oh my goodness, the speaking test or, or the writing test, the productive side of things, or, or even the listening test because there's, there's, you can only hear it once or twice, you know? Um, they don't often say reading, and yet, and yet reading is an area where, um, where they don't perform particularly well. So let's look at why. I think part of the reason is that the students will see a reading text and just read it. The other part is that it's often given for homework, so students can comfortably sit down with a, a drink and a dictionary and take their time and... and uh, they don't feel the intensity that they feel during an exam where they have to read multiple texts over a short period of time. And the other thing is they, they approach all three tasks in the same way. And of course, uh, again, I'll, I'll, uh, I've got a question about wash back and backwash. They mean the same thing. It's the psychological effect of the test on the students who are taking it. Um, just sorry, just to answer one of the questions. So let's have a look what I mean. Uh, I've got something from uh, exam, uh, from, from uh, Gold Experience, which is a Pearson book. All of the examples here are from Gold Experience. Uh, this is your typical uh, multiple choice question. Um, when I go into a class and I observe an exam class, I'm really interested to have a look at the state of the course books if they're, if they're using course books. Because one of the things that frustrates me is a lot of classes, the students don't write on the text. They don't use the text as a tool. They think, oh, this is my course book. I don't want to make it dirty. I, I want to make it pristine and clean. Um, so I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to mark the book. But obviously, when they take the reading exam, uh, it's, it's a key advantage to mark parts of the text. So I always encourage my students to, to, to mark the text, especially with multiple choice, because generally a multiple choice test is linear. So that means that, that, that question one will talk about the first paragraph, question two will talk about the next paragraph, Question three might look at explaining a word on, on line 44, so you know that question four is after line 44. I think it's really good to, to get the students to, to, to mark the text and analyze, okay, this is where the answer to number one is. I don't know the answer to number one yet, but I'm gonna have a look at it. Um, let's, let's, let's go at a closer example. So, so one of the things that I always tell my students is, examiners do not waste ink. There is a reason for everything in the exam rubric. Yeah, there's a reason for everything. Uh, and if you look at the question, can you all read the, uh, the paragraph? Is it big enough? I hope. Yeah, and again, again, someone's mentioned if, if you're in a, a situation where the, the, the students have to share books, I always think it's a good idea to just write down on a note paper the keywords rather than underlining it. Yeah? Um, okay, so, so let's have a look. What we have here is, of course, a question, and we have four possible answers. One is correct. The other three are designed to distract. Um, they're the, 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 the nice, creamy-looking cakes in the cake stall that are going to give you a stomachache. So I always get the students to start with the questions. Forget the text. Start with the questions. So. If we look at question number one, it says, what does it say in the first paragraph about the competitors at Champs? Uh, the key word, if there is, or the key phrase on that question is what? What does it say in the first paragraph about the competitors at Champs? Well, obviously, we're only talking about the competitors at Champs and not other people. So, so you'd expect the students to, to 
to very clearly, absolutely, the competitors. Nobody else, but the competitors at this particular event. Right. So let's have a look and see if you can, uh, can quickly find the answer, uh, which is one thing, and then look at the distractors. So what I've got for you is, is a little bit of, of, of what I mean when I talk about uh, uh, highlighting. Uh, here we have an A, athletics teams from around the world. And we can see in the text we've got athletics contest and athletes and, and in the world. So we've got similar words. Uh, in D, if we look at the last one, we've got they win a lot of international running races. And we've got dominated international sprint events. Um, so, so that seems to be a good, clear match. And then C, we've got have won Olympic medals. And we've got Olympic gold medals there. The problem is with, with C and D, uh, we're not talking about competitors at champs. We're talking about uh, Caribbean athletes in general. So C and D are nice, tasty distractors, but they're wrong. A, of course, um, is, is not so tasty, but it might confuse a few students because they, they can see the word athletics and they can see the word world. And so if they, they don't have a clue, they'll fall for A. The, the key thing, though, is that uh, the teenagers, the teenagers who compete in, uh, in champs, the competitors, are the ones who want to build a better life for themselves and their families and build a better life. Uh, they see it. It's obviously B. So we can see how highlighting the text can be really important uh, for the students to understand these multiple choice exercises. Let's have a look at the, the next one. Uh, it's a small paragraph. Just have a quick read through. Again, here, we're not too worried about... Um, would I project these on a screen while I'm teaching? Yeah, if I, if I could. You know, if I had a, an old OHP, I might, I might use that. If I had a visualizer, I might use that. If I had a fancy... Um, uh, IWB, I might use that, but if I had nothing, I would still get the students to 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 uh, analyze. Um, yeah, you, you don't get any prizes for getting the answers right. You're all English teachers. What we have to look at is is why the distractors are wrong. So so let's have a look at we, we you've identified correctly. C is the right answer, but let's have a look at A. A has the word schoolwork. And the last sentence contains schoolwork. Yeah, I know teachers like being students, Danuta. I know that. Uh, so, so again, we have exactly the same words. B, late at, very late at night, and they have late in the evening. But here, uh, you have the opposite. They have to train until very late at night. And in the sentence, it says they can't stay out late at night. And D, you've, you've got the opposite as well. Quite often you see the opposite. So calories, high calorie diet, eat fewer calories. So lots of distractors. And again, uh, obviously, if we have a comprehension question where the text says, John gets up at 7 o'clock every morning, and the, the question is, what time does John get up every morning? None of the students are going to have any difficulty with that. What we're checking for here is the fact that, that, that they can understand comprehension. And we do this by putting in distractors to show that they don't understand. And so it's important that the students check very quickly to see why the other distractors are there. This is a level B1 uh, plus stroke B2. Yeah, it, it, it's on the road to B2. So it is part of a, a, a first B2 exam. Uh, and again, you can do the same thing with the rest of the text. We're not going to do that. We're going to move on to a matching exercise. And a matching exercise will look at something completely different. When I say a matching exercise, I'm talking about a text that's divided into other texts. Here we've got uh, texts that's divided into four. Um, 
What I don't want my students doing is wasting a lot of time trying to understand the overall uh, context of the article. No one's interested in, in, in the actual context of the article and on what it's saying. What we're interested in this matching exercise is vocabulary, is lexis, is, is words and expressions that, that, that mean the same. That's all that's being tested. So make sure your students don't waste loads of time trying to connect the different pieces of text together. As I said, it's, it's not being tested. So, so what I, I tend to do here is I do a lot of substitution exercises. So, so I hope you can see the, the text from, again, it comes from uh, Gold Experience, the Pearson book. And you can see my little, I don't know, light green or light blue box with some vocabulary in. And if you look at the vocabulary, you can see that the first expression there is not dead. Can you find a word in the text, maybe in the first couple of sentences, that could substitute not dead or not dead could alive, of course, that's right. So I'm going to give you a tiny, not enough time to do it properly, but a tiny um, amount of time to see how many other words you can find uh, from that you can replace in the text with the words in the blue box. And as you're doing that, I'll have a sip of water. Again, the important thing is this is a good exercise if you've got different levels in your class because you can grade with the lower levels simpler language uh, so they can, you, you can have easier words in the blue box or harder language so you can you can go up or down um, also with the highest students you don't have any words in the in, in the blue box you get the students to to take another text and they create their own words uh, so it's something you can do very easily with uh, with different levels as I said I'm not going to give you enough time to, to do all the exercises you wanted competition some of you well this is a competition you're not going to win because we're going on to the next slide you can check a few of the words that you've got there um, being able to use synonyms antonyms and co hyponyms and superordinates is incredibly important for the the lexical knowledge that's tested in lots of parts of this exam so I often encourage my students to, um, to recycle vocabulary uh, by using English, not by translation. Um, let me see if we can, we can do something like this. Uh, I am going to define 10 words, OK? And you're going to either type them into the chat box or write them down on a piece of paper. Or if you've got an exceptional memory, try and memorize them all. And let's see how you do. Are we ready to start? So, word number one. Uh, this is the opposite of interesting. Uh, I've got two teenage daughters, so when I suggest something, they say, oh, Dad, we don't want to do that. That's really, that's the first word. Number two, my brother has two children, uh, a boy, my nephew, and a girl, my, um, well, it's not my nephew, it's uh, someone else. Uh, number three, when I cook, I tend to use the hob. Uh, to, to boil water or fry things. When I'm being really ambitious, though, and I want to bake a cake, I will use um, uh, this thing that put things in, you know? Uh, it's not the hob. Uh, the opposite of buy, if I need to raise some money, I will uh, do something else. I won't buy. I'll. Uh, and again, we talked about uh, norm referencing. So someone comes first. If someone comes first, someone obviously has to also come not first, not second, but, but the final one. Yep. Uh, again, you might say, please, uh, you're talking too quickly. Please speak more. The opposite, fast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, chicken, uh, a chlorine-covered chicken, if you're American, um, can be male or female. So a male chicken is called a rooster or a cock. What's a, what's a female chicken called? Yeah, absolutely. And when I'm cooking this wonderful chicken, uh, in order to not get my shirt covered in, in, in something, I will, um, 
I will wear something that will I can tie behind my back. That's right. Not a tie, but uh, yeah. And then, of course, um, if 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 my ears are blocked, I would say I can't. Um, I can't. I'm trying to listen, but I can't. Yeah. Uh huh. And then um, at every start. Every starting point has a uh, not an end point, but um, but you know when you go over that line, the line is called exactly, and and so doing simple little activities like this uh, is is really productive for the students and gets them looking at uh, at the type of thing that's that's tested uh, with this matching exercises. Uh, now. How do your students feel about gapped texts? Do they get excited when they see an exercise like this? And they think, right, OK. Um, probably not. Probably this is the hardest of, of, of the three types. It's challenging, as you say, yeah. Um, part of the problem is, by the time the students have got to this part, uh, they're already exhausted, you know, they're, they're not used to reading for this long. And, um, and, and so they, they dive in, they start reading the article, teacher lives on one pound a day, and, uh, and they struggle. Um, and they're making a fundamental mistake because they shouldn't be reading the article. Uh, because this part of the text is all about testing cohesion and coherence. And it's not about understanding the text at all. It's understanding how the text is knitted together. So um, yeah, I again, someone says they can't concentrate for too long. Yeah, I always tell my students, you don't have to answer the exam questions in the order that they appear, except, of course, the listening. You can go for the ones that, that, that's most challenging first, and then go back and answer the other ones. And, and I feel not enough students do that. Right, so, so, so what am I saying? I'm saying that if we look at, let's have a look at these four sentences, OK? Uh, these four sentences are taken from four different contexts. They're not connected in any way. What they have in common is they have a lot of reference. Yeah? Uh, so what do I mean when I mean refer reference? Well, let's have a look at the first, uh, first sentence. It was when she saw him do that to the other girl that she finally decided to finish it. So obviously pronouns, obviously uh, relative pronouns, demonstratives uh, indicate you know, things like it, uh, him, that. These are the sort of clues that, that tell us what's happened before and suggest what might happen afterwards. Uh, so have a quick look at those four sentences. If I tell you that, that, that one of those maybe comes from a teaching context with a, with a male teacher, um, what one do we think? What number would be a male teacher? Uh, so I've got a couple of numbers. Yeah, so, so ooh, OK, all right, mainly three. Um, let's have a look. So, so, so some people have said four. If it was three, we could say when the teacher came in, uh, the students got maybe their books out of their bags and, uh, and started to uh, correct the homework with the teacher. Of course, number four, of course, um, not knowing the student's name embarrassed the student. The, uh, the more uh, embarrassed the teacher, the more he, he kept on talking the more uncomfortable she felt about not remembering it. Oh, well, it's a great lesson where the student's doing all the speaking, but I did specify that the teacher was male to avoid you using number three, but never mind. Um, one of them, perhaps, uh, is connected to relationships. Maybe we can say the first one. So I get my students to look very carefully at the gaps first. And um, when we look at the gaps, and when we try and predict the context, it can really help us slot them in. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Again, this comes from, from New Gold Experience. We've got our, our seven sentences. I'd like you to, to spend uh, a few seconds having a look at those seven, and then we'll talk about them.
Okay, so so if we look at the key words, uh, remember we're talking about teacher living on one pound a day. So if we look at A, we'll assume that the teacher is called Kath, yeah? So Kath admits that she ate lots of soup during the year made from reduced price vegetables. So we've got reduced price vegetables as a key word and, and soup, lots of soup, okay. B, uh, in particular, so we've got a specific example. In particular, she was concerned, she was worried. So this is a particular example about her being worried about not being able to afford something. Okay, fine. So, so we've got to talk about money worries before. C, we've got contrast in spite of this. So in spite of this, she was, even, she was able to save even more money in a range of ways. Okay. D, the key word there that, that flies out is finally. It's a sequencer. Uh, and again, finally managed to save enough money to buy her brother a decent. And so that's tied to B, which is talking about her brother's wedding present too. E, again, we've got contrast. But. But it wasn't like that at all. So but is contrast. So we're, we're contrasting it to a different opinion or a different situation. F. Every time there was a public event, I was there. So we expect something about public events. And G, this, well, what? This was the cost of a mobile phone. So this was an expense that she couldn't afford. Okay, so if we've spent our time and we've analyzed these gaps uh, clearly, then we don't really need to spend much time with the actual exercise. We can look at the sentence before and after. Let's, let's see what I mean. So, so let's have a look at number one. Uh, Kath, there we go. Kath was complaining about all her money worries. So we did have a sentence about complaining about money worries, didn't we? I think it was one of those letters. Uh, number two, uh, they, imagined, they imagined I would be living um, like a hermit, never going out or borrowing from them, but they were wrong because I did go out. Uh, number three, we're talking about reduced um, going to buying food. So one of the sentences was about food and reduced food and sell-by dates. Let's go on. Um, again, number four, uh, what have we got? Public lectures at Bristol University, the library's 100th, 100th birthday party. So something about those for number four. Number five, uh, the sentence before it says, this increased because of another saving she had to make. So something else she couldn't afford to do. wonder what that was. Number six, she successfully completed the challenge that she had set herself. So, so something at the beginning. All right. Um, so, so I haven't really read that text, but I've spent my time looking at the gaps. And I've made educated guesses, and lo and behold... My guesses are fine. Uh, again, we're not looking for, uh, for anything other than the, the glue that ties it together. And if we spend a lot of time looking at the gaps before we look at the text, your students will find that type of exercise far easier. All right, let's go on. Use of English. Gap fills, multiple choice, word formation, sentence transformation. Okay, where shall we start? Uh, let's do the multiple choice. Uh, here it is, um, again from, from uh, Gold Experience, or New Gold Experience, I should say. And we've got a text, and we've got the multiple choice. What I feel students sometimes uh, get distracted with is the text. They start reading the text about how personalities develop. They want to understand what the text means. Uh, but nobody's going to ask some comprehension questions about how personalities develop. No one's really interested in, 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 in the text as a whole. Multiple choice at this level tests lexical grammar. It just tests dependent uh, collocations. So, so in actual fact, your students shouldn't be reading the text. Yes, I suggest they skim the text, but when they're skimming the text, they should really be skimming just to underline or highlight the co-text, the words before and after the gaps. Um, in actual fact, if, if they've done that, 
And if you have a look at the, the, the box underneath, here, is the, here are the words before and after the gaps. I would suggest you have enough information there to be able to complete that, uh, that, that multiple choice. Um, and, and if you begin to show students that they can answer it without understanding the text, then, then they know what's being tested. They can analyze it, yeah? Uh, they still might need to learn that interested in is the correct preposition. You've still got to teach them things, but they're not going to get distracted by the topic, and that's important. And let's move on. Let's, let's go on to the, uh, the close, the, the gap fill. Uh, again, sorry, if we go back, if we look at the, the choices in the, the multiple choice, you can see that we have a lot of words here that are content words, that are lexical words, you know? There are a few, the first one, at, with, in, and for, are grammar and structural words, but generally, it's the content words that are being tested in the multiple choice. Conversely, with the, um, the gap fill, it's the structural words. Uh, so uh, it's time to start a new club, uh, which helps other people, who are trying to read, interested in helping again, you know, one hour on Wednesday. So it's the, the, the structural words. One of the things I do, um, it takes a little bit of time, but not too much, and it's, it's preparation well given, is um, I'll take one of these gap fills and I'll type it out. And I'll say to the students, right, okay, uh, let's see if you could get a job as a, a, a tester, an English tester. See if you can design a test. Um, the, F, the, the first, the B2, the old FCE, uh, has eight gaps plus an example. So from this text, nine words were removed. One word, the example word, was removed from the first paragraph. Which word do you think was removed? And why? <coughs> Obviously, it's not going to be eyes, because it could be a number of different things. Uh, pour over, that's a very good one. It might be slightly higher than B2, though. OK, uh, again, uh, go through. Go through, go through again is quite difficult, um, but it's possible. I'd say it's a higher level. Um, again, pain is, is, is not a word that would be removed because it could be replaced by any number of words, and we want to be quite restricted. Why is, is a good one. Uh, again, for the sake of is a fixed expression that could be quite good. So could be quite good. So far, though, everyone hasn't managed to get the word. Uh, it doesn't matter what it what it does matter. What it does do is get you focusing on the type of words that are being tested. Yeah, still nobody has got the word. Aha! You see, so you're looking at grammar words, which is really good, and you're choosing lots and lots and lots of grammar words, which is really good. But none of them, and again, none of them are the words that, 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 that you would choose. Because if you have a look, you can see that the word that was removed as an example was much. Yeah? Uh, and again, it's used as an example because it's clear to the students what's being tested, much and many. Yeah? Um, you wrote it. Sorry, Grazina, you, 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 you were one of the few. Uh, and again, you can see what other words are removed. It doesn't matter if the students predict correctly. What you're doing is getting to focus on the type of stuff that's removed. And this gets them focusing on, on, on what information is missing. And generally, uh, you will often find uh, few's and much's and any's. And, and certainly, I, I, I've yet, the frequency of tests where you don't see a word like if or or whereas in there or, or some sort of con contrast is 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 very low so so i do that uh, let's go on to the next one word formation my goodness um how do we how we do how do we test for affixations 
Well, you know, sometimes I'll 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 write up a suffix grid on the board, you know, and I say, right, okay, let's let's say we're talking about education. Uh, student A, you have a minute or thirty seconds or ninety seconds, depending on the level, to talk about education to your partner. Your partner is going to listen attentively, and every time you use a word with uh, uh, one of these suffixes. You know, they're going to give you a point. So the teacher was careless and, and not attentive to the persistent, uh, uh, playful uh, students, unruly students at the back. You see, I've scored loads of points already. A uh, reason to listen and a reason to speak and a reason to use um, uh, uh, affixations. I'll sometimes do word races. If a word comes up, uh, it's a, a love, let's say. What a nice word. How many words can you form from the root love? Well, I'll, I'll get the students to work in pairs. I'll get them to not just look at derivatives, but I'll get them to look at, at other ones too. So obviously, um, one of the problems with the word formation exercise is the fact that sometimes students forget plurals or they forget third person. So, so I'll give them a list like that, and I'll say, OK, you know. Did you get all 16? In fact, there are more. Uh, so, so getting them to have an awareness of, of word formation uh, is very easy to do with an activity like that. You know, just take a, a high frequency word that comes up in the text and just stop the class for a second. Let's have a word race. All right, probably my, my students' favorite exercise of the use of English is um, this wonderful thing. Yeah, sentence transformations. They burst into smiles and, and laughter when they come across these exercises. Um, no, they don't. No, I lied. Uh, in fact, they struggle and they hate them. I don't know if that's true for your, your students too. Uh, for a start, they get caught up in the context. They spend ages looking at the context in sentence one. And the context has loads of extra baggage. So, so, so we really want to remove the baggage, if you like. So the first thing I get the students to do, and again, it's marking on textbooks, but uh, I think it's worth them copying the, uh, the two sentences if you can't mark the textbooks. Um, and, and then I get them to remove the excess baggage, if you like. So any words or phrases that, that appear twice that are duplicated well they're not being tested so if you look at the example sentence we can see that we're left with can't be easy and we have must now quite a few times in these transformations we have to change more than one thing sometimes it's the type of word uh, an adjective to a noun and, and those sorts of things and quite a few times it's 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 the opposite so it can't be easy, must be difficult, or must be hard. Uh, and again, here we've got couldn't, well, couldn't is, is wasn't able to, yeah? And so on and so on. So just, just, just looking at, um, <coughs> just looking at the, the basic bits will, will help them look at the reciprocal pairs. Sometimes, <coughs> I'll give them, Later on in the semester, I'll give them something a little bit more demanding. So here we have eight strange-looking sentences. Why did you blag your pribble flib, trude the stripper? Well, if you notice, a lot of the content words mean absolutely nothing, uh, but the grammar is the same as English. Um, obviously, you can work out that Trude is a verb because of the affixation. Uh, blag is a verb because, of the, again, the position. So we can sort of work out the word forms from the positioning. Uh, I might ask my students to try and find one way of translating this so it makes sense in English. Um, or what I could do is I could say, right, we have eight nonsense sentences. Can you find one connection? Can you translate it into something that, that, that's using a different structure but means the same thing? 
So have a look at the, the eight letters, and let's see who's the first one to, uh, to match a letter with a number. A8, why did you blag your pribble flib, truth the stribbler? The interviewer asked me why I had left my previous job. Well done, Danuta, you were first. And there we have got, uh, again, H in the, 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 the bottom one, so you can see. Yes, it is difficult. So, so, so uh, you might give them something like this, and so they don't have to match, but they have to translate the letters so they mean the same as the numbers, and that's a lot easier. And again, it gets them looking at reciprocal pairs. So, of course, when they translate, they can see what's, what's being tested, and that can be quite useful. Right, let's go on to listening. Uh, we've got two types of listening. We've got objective listening uh, and productive. Objective is, is answering the questions, and productive is writing in the gaps, I suppose. So let's have a quick look. Uh, again, one of the differences between multiple choice in the reading and multiple choice in the listening is obviously in the listening you have more than one speaker and so most of the time uh, the distractors are in the question what do I mean is is, is let's have a look at for example uh, question number two you will hear two friends talking about moving how does the girl feel about moving to a new city obviously we're not interested in the male voice uh, again, getting the students to underline, underline and focus on the question in the short amount of time before they start listening. Don't ask them to predict what they're going to hear, but get them to focus on the, uh, the question, underline the key thing in the question paper so that they are, are listening for uh, a shared idea or they're listening for the male voice or they're listening for the female voice. Um, this is the key to doing that. So, so get them to spend some time on the questions, not, not the choices. Uh, let's go on to a matching exercise. Um, again, the matching exercise where you have to talk, talk about various speakers, I think it's, um, it's good to, to, here's an old, an old example, an old uh, first certificate exam. Uh, so we've got a topic. The topic is crime prevention. And we've got uh, six lessons, letters, yeah, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, I'll, I'll turn these listenings into a speaking because the matching exercises are normally looking at functional uh, language. They're looking at exponents. Uh, so I might get the students to choose, let's say, A. One of the students will choose A. He won't tell the other students uh, that he's chosen A or his partner. Uh, but he will say something, so uh, not using the words in A, but maybe he'll say things like, uh, I really need help. I, uh, it's not possible to, to, um, to solve problems without help. Uh, we need not more officers, but we need uh, other help. And, of course, you're saying, right, it's A. So, so you get them using functional language. In fact, if we, if we have a look, uh, what I've done here is I've taken the text and I've removed anything connected to the topic whatsoever. The topic was crime prevention, so I've taken away any specific words connected to crime and I've underlined and focused on uh, the, the functional language. So here we've got, I'm not really worried about, and I think we can get, all this out of proportion and I do think we spend too much time thinking about it and finally I have more important things to think about so these are the functional language and if you had to guess obviously it's F isn't it it's not really a serious problem so getting the students to realize that it's really the functional language that plays a key point in the, um, the matching exercises is important uh, again, with the production, uh, one of the things that I find uh, frustrating is students panic and they're going to listen to the text twice, uh, but they never listen the first time without writing. If they hear something, they want to write it down. I make them hold their pencils up like this, upside down, so they can't write. 
and then the first time they listen, they bang it on the ground. That means the better students hear the answer, the weaker students hear the better students banging on the table, and they, oh, I missed something, and then the second time round, it's good for both of them. Uh, uh, we haven't got much time left, so without further afraid, let's move on to speaking. Uh, they have to describe personal information and describing things, discussions. Um, at the beginning of the semester, I'll always get them to talk about two things. Uh, living in the city or living in the country, winter holidays or summer holidays, um, teaching kids or teaching um, adults. So that they're, they're used to comparing. They're used to, 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 to giving extended answers because they've got some comparative language. And then suddenly, about halfway through the course, I stop giving them two options. And I give them one option. And what happens is, through their mind, as soon as I say, talk about families, they automatically have two, big families, small families. Or talk about health, public health, private health. And, and that sort of idea, that process of expanding a topic can be really useful in, in giving longer answers in the monologue. With the picture description, well, I tell my students, you know, there's no point describing something uh, until you can describe nothing. So I give them something like this, and I say, right, I want you to talk about this picture for a minute. I said, there's nothing there. I said, well, learn how to talk about nothing. Uh, in, in, in front of the nothing, there's nothing. Behind the nothing, there's nothing. To the right of the nothing, there's nothing. And if you look, just below the nothing, you can see a little bit more nothing. And then when they can do that using the functional language for a minute, I say, right, now describe these two and compare them. Well, compared to that nothing, this nothing looks slightly more nothingless than that nothing. And again, when they feel confident, confident at, at, at speaking for a longer period of time on nothing, giving them a picture is easy. Going on to the uh, uh, collaborative task, I might do a word grab, so I'll get the students to write things on pieces of paper, and then they'll talk about the topic, they'll do the task uh, together, but every time they use one of these words, they grab it. And then at the end of three minutes, we'll, we'll see who's got the most. Uh, and I think that's a good way of including some, some interactive language. Writing. Uh, we'll talk more about the, the input-based tasks next Wednesday, but let's talk about open-ended tasks. I find my students, when they're given an open-ended, a free writing task, they tend to write within themselves. So they don't want to make mistakes, and they'll write simple language, and they'll get marked down because they're not showing their lexical range. So, so sometimes, let's say we've got a for and against essay. Well, here's an essay. Um, we can show the model answers, it's fine, but, uh, but we've, got, um, we've got this. So I'll give them a structure. I'll say, right, okay, we're going to write for and against living in a city and living in a small town. Here's the information I want you to include. It's correct, but it's really basic. So I don't want you to write the same sentences. I want you to really expand your vocab and, uh, and, um, and try and write a for and against transferring this information. So I'll make, I'll make a, a, an input-driven writing task, sorry, an output-driven writing task, input-driven to begin with. Um, also, I, uh, I'll do a bit of fast writing where I'll, uh, I'll say, right, okay, um, yeah, don't worry, Elizabeth, uh, you'll get all the slides uh, um, in the recording, so don't worry about that. I'll write some words up on the board. I'll say to the students, right, you're going to work in pairs. Look at the words on the board. No writing to start off with. Uh, we're going to talk about whatever we've been talking about in the lesson. Every time in your writing that you're going to do in a second, every time you use one of these words correctly, you'll score a point. Every time you use one incorrectly, you'll lose a point. Discuss how to score as many points as possible. So they discuss. And then, lo and behold, you give them some time to write, maximum of five minutes. They write a hell of a lot, and you can get some peer uh, correction going on. Um, just to tell you that when you're tracking progress, uh, you can track it in class, or you can use a variety of diaries and, and, and databases. We'll talk more about this when we talk about giving feedback. You can use an online management system like My English Lab, 
which which well you can you can just make sure that you're monitoring the important thing is and i'm going to go through because i've run out of time worry we'll we'll cover a lot that i haven't covered uh next week when we talk about feedback and if you'd like to join that session uh you can join the session um on the link below uh, an open-ended task is a task a writing task where um where you don't have input. It's not a transactional piece of writing. It's write a story or write a for and against essay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much for your time. And if you feel like it, I hope to see you this time next week. Thank you very much and goodbye. Have an enjoyable weekend. Yeah, next week, don't worry about the slides we didn't cover. Feedback is covering a lot of those slides, and we'll do some more practical activities, different ones, next Wednesday. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye.